Good morning. And uh, man, what a, what a last 10 days it has been for this body of believers. As we saw our executive pastor, uh, Brother Dan Wilson, go to be at the Lord suddenly and uh, been, been dealing with a lot of that. Uh, uh, Alan and uh, Seibel and myself had the opportunity to, to go Tuesday after the service that was here Monday uh, last week. We had the opportunity to go Tuesday to Joplin and to uh, do the uh, graveside. And, and once again, the graveside was one of the largest that I've ever done. Um, just lots of people there, uh, lots of representatives from Ozark Christian College, as well as others that couldn't attend. We actually had a, a preacher from Oklahoma City that couldn't come to the service here on Monday, actually drove to Joplin to the graveside. Um, so just just amazing, amazing thing. And, and I know that we're still mourning, and I know that we still, our, our minds and our thoughts really need to be with uh, Jane and, and the boys as they continue to mourn. But I do want to tell you this morning that we are going to get through this, and it's because of the hope we have in Jesus Christ that all things are possible. And even to say uh, goodbye to a dearly loved one, a friend, a pastor here at our church, um, we, we also just know that God is still on the throne. He's still doing the salvation work that he has done before and will continue to do so. So I just want to remember that and offer that word of encouragement to you uh, as we continue this morning. Um, this is part six of a series this morning that we've been in called Counterculture, and this will be the last installment of this series. Um, it's kind of funny because I was, uh, we were talking backstage uh, before first service. What we do is we gather the worship team and we uh, pray together and we take communion together because a lot of times we're up here when you all are taking communion, so we take it backstage together. And, and we were just uh, talking and, and, and one of the, somebody asked, you know, this counterculture series that you've been doing, did you write that like before Supreme Court decisions and straight state Supreme Court decisions about the Ten Commandments and before all that was all this written it's like yeah I mean that was written months ago and it's like well that's amazing how you know God can can you know work in the planning you know how his Holy Spirit moves and it seems like the more I go through life is like God and his spirit has just the right thing at just the right time and so God knew I mean, God knows everything. He, he, he knew this, what the Supreme Court was going to rule. He knew what was going to be happening at this time. And he helped prepare me and through the word, uh, prepare all of us really for what was coming. And so uh, God just has a way with that. So we give him all the credit and all the glory for that. Um, we're we're going to talk today, um, part six of our series. It, it's entitled Death is Life. And if you have your Bible this morning, you want to open it, we're just going to look at one verse this morning. We are going to have it on the screen in a little bit, but it's Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25 is what we'll be looking at this morning. You know, we've been in this series, Counterculture, for, for several weeks. And, you know, if there's anything that I hope you've learned from it, I hope you've learned that Jesus... He taught some things and he said some things that were unconventional. He said some things and taught some things that were considered controversial at the time. I mean, a lot of, a lot of why he was put to death, of course, was God's plan, but it was also on the physical reality of it was that he had said some things and performed some miracles and done some teachings and had some philosophies that countered culture enough to make him mad to make him want to crucify him. And so uh, we shouldn't find ourselves caught off guard. You know, so many of us want a, a, a warm, snuggly Jesus. You know, Jesus is like a snuggie. You know, you put him on and he's fuzzy and warm and he holds us and we hold him and we love. And, you know, that's our, but Jesus was kind of, you know, a rebel for his time. He was one that was bold and, and, and was courageous because he knew what his convictions were as the son of God. And he knew what he had to do. He had to set things that were wrong right again. It's amazing as we go through this and see what he did. Our working definition for counterculture, one last time, just so we remember. Counterculture is a way of life and set of values opposed to or at variance from the prevailing societal norm. And we talked about what that means. It's a way of life or set of values that's opposed to, maybe it's completely opposed to, or maybe it's just slightly at variance from the prevailing societal norm. What, what society, what culture would say, well, that's just normal. Jesus takes those things and, and turns them. You know, we study that the last is first. And in our world, it says, hey, no, first is first. But we find out in the kingdom of God and the way that it should be is that last is first. The greatest among you will be your servant. We find out that it was more blessed to give than to receive. And we say, hey, you know, we're in a culture now. We're more blessed to receive. And I want to receive even more. And I, I, I want to win the lottery. And, I, and I, want, I just want more. And receiving is good. It is more blessed to receive 
But Jesus says, no, it, it is actually more blessed to give than receive. We found out that slavery is freedom. Slavery is freedom when Jesus is your master. We found out um, last week that weak is strong in the kingdom of God. And as we've gone through this time with the passing of Dan, we're reminded that, that in our weakness, we can be strong in Christ, in the kingdom of God. But instead of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, Jesus said, if someone strikes you on your cheek, turn to them the other one as well. Or you've heard it said to hate your enemies, but Jesus says to love your enemies. And it was just kind of his countercultural way. Well, today Jesus wants to introduce us to one more countercultural truth this morning. It's found in Matthew 16, 25. And this is what it says. Matthew 16, 25. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. And we're going to talk about this really on two different levels today because there is a spiritual sense to this verse. There's also a physical sense to this verse. And you can read that and say, well, this is a paradox, because that's how we tend to see things. We think, hey, life is life and death is death. But Jesus comes and says, no, actually, death is life. It's a paradox, but it's really quite simple. Because what Jesus is saying here is that whoever lives only to save his earthly life, only valuing things that are here and now, temporary things, you will lose your opportunity for eternal life in heaven with Jesus. But whoever is willing to give up this earthly and worldly life for Christ's sake, and they'll identify themselves with Jesus, he will find himself in eternity with Jesus in heaven. In other words, death is life when we give up who we are for who we can be in Christ. Death is life when we give up who we are for who we can be in Christ. And this begins by denying Ourself by actually dying to ourself. And even the Apostle Paul reminds us that when he said, I die daily, and he was referencing this crucif crucifixion of the flesh, that daily he had to die to himself to be made alive fully in Christ. And we can relate to this. And there's lots of scriptures in the Bible that talk about uh, um, sin and death and, and eternal life and glory with Jesus. Romans 3.23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, one of my favorite uh, chapters in the Bible, one of my favorite passages that Alan read earlier. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says that you are dead in your transgressions and sins. But you get to verses 4 and 5 of Ephesians chapter 2 and it says, but God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. So we're going to focus on the physical aspect of death as life for just a few minutes this morning before we get to the spiritual side of it. You see, death is one of the greatest weapons that Satan has in his arsenal of evil. All of us have felt the sting of its blow, and it causes us to ponder, maybe even just for a split second, what's going to happen to me when I die? When I expire, when I pass away, what's really going to happen to me? But we need to remember that Christians die better than anyone else because we know what happens next. We know who holds our future and we can rest in the salvation offered us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Christians, we just sang songs about this. A whole worship set about this this morning, proclaiming that truth. You know, every person has an eternal choice. Every person makes that choice for themselves. Some of us make an eternal choice through denial. Some of us make it through denial. If you're a baseball fan, you've probably heard the name of a man by the name of Ted Williams, perhaps the greatest hitter in the history of Major League Baseball. You want to know where Ted is today? Today he spends his time in a one-story warehouse near Scottsdale, Arizona, near the airport. Literally. He's been there since the day after his death in 2002. You see, his curators don't like the word death, and the Alcor Life Extension Program prefers to say that he ended his first life cycle. You see, when Ted Williams died, well, excuse me, when he ended his first life cycle at the age of 83, he was packed on a, in a crate of ice, flown to Arizona, injected with some form of human antifreeze, and placed in a stainless steel bay where he and 58 other residents at that time await their mulligans at minus 196 degrees Celsius. 
Counting on future advancements in technology that will unfreeze them back to life someday. They're banking their bodies on the hope of reanimation. That someone someday will poke a needle or push a button and trigger for all of these people life cycle number two. And that's the truth. But the truth is that Ted's family spent $128,000 on a wish that he might get an extension to life or that he might get a do-over. And that's just denial. I mean, don't base your eternal destination on denial that you can somehow evade it, that it's not coming. Every human has one thing in common, that we are all going to die. And some of us make an eternal choice through avoidance. I mean, surely you've met these people before. We're just going to avoid the topic altogether. We're going to avoid the elephant in the room. We try not to think about what happens when we die. We don't ever want to talk about death or eternal things. We blow it off. We act like it doesn't exist. And we avoid it. And when we avoid it, we feel safer that way. We don't have to face up to reality. We can avoid facing the truth. But the fact is, it doesn't change that it is actually true. But through that denial, we are ultimately making our choice for eternal destination for ourselves. In that case, death is actually death. When we don't deal and we try to avoid, we've actually already made the deal ourselves. But then some of us make an eternal choice through facing reality. The reality that we're all going to pass away someday. The reality that when your time is up, your time is up, it is over, you don't get a redo. Hebrews chapter 9, 27 reminds us of that. It says, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. That's it. There's no extension of life. There's no do-over. It's final. But Jesus beat that and conquered death by resurrection. Yes, he died completely. And he was in the grave and buried in the tomb. But then he resurrected. And he overcame death. Our reality check is whether we accept that truth or not in our lives. The missionary Jim Elliott put it this way, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Let me read that again. Think about this. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And that's precisely what Jesus is saying to us in Matthew 16, 25, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. You can give up what you will not keep anyway, which is your life on earth, to gain what you cannot lose in a relationship with Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. But you must die to gain the truest form of life. It's almost like you have to lose yourself in Jesus. And many of you were there, at least at one point in your life. I remember the time where I completely lost myself and was just completely in tune with Jesus was probably at the time of my conversion. You know, I was one of those kids that I grew up in the church, and so I, you know, I, I was a church brat, and, and I knew, you know, I'd been in Sunday school and had all the medals to show for it. You know, sword drill, I was really good. I could find it fast in my Bible, but I'd never really, you know, surrendered fully to Jesus Christ. I'd never called upon his name and, and called him my Savior and Lord. I'd never been baptized. And I, I remember I was 12 years old. I was, I was at a, a church camp at Camp Sooner in, in Pink, Oklahoma. And I remember it was a Thursday night. We had an outdoor chapel service. And, and I remember the speaker. It was like he was just speaking directly to me. He presented the gospel, and I was convicted of my sins. And, and I, I just chose right then that I was going to repent and to go God's way and to give my life over to him. And I'll never forget that invitation time out there at the outdoor chapel. And I went forward, and I, I remember talking to our youth minister at the time. And, and then I remember walking back uh, uh, to camp to these cabins. And we were in like cabin two, which was like one of the furthest distances from the chapel. And I remember walking with two or three of my really good friends, my brothers in the Lord, and us just talking, feeling really convicted that, that Jesus had done this for us. We've got to live for him. And I remember in that moment and in the days and weeks after that, there was no Eric. I mean, my identity did not matter. It was all about Jesus Christ. I had died and been brought to life again through Jesus Christ. And that's what, what he's talking about here when he says that you have to lose your life. Because when losing your life, you'll actually find it in Jesus Christ. Death is life. 
when we give up who we are for who we can be in Christ. So there's this physical reality to this verse that beckons us to ponder the end of our life. But there's also a significant spiritual aspect on how we live our lives for Him right now. You know, another way that Jesus said that death is life is actually found in John, in in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, with a story of an interaction he had with a Pharisee named Nicodemus. John chapter 3. Nicodemus, see, he was a sharply dressed man. He was a Pharisee. He was highly cultured. He was well-educated and probably very wealthy. He was a member of the Jewish ruling council called the Sanhedrin, which meant that he was a Pharisee amongst Pharisees. You see, a Pharisee was a religious elitist, one who knew the law and kept the law, and one that just was good at keeping the law, or so they thought. And so Nicodemus was one of those guys that loved God. I mean, he truly loved God. He loved the law of God. And it seems like as we read Scripture, they takes a liking to Jesus. We see that in John chapter 3 and John chapter 7 and again in, in chapter 19. Nicodemus loves God, but he takes a liking to Jesus. And Nicodemus was one of those guys that, that he could have spent his time with anyone. I mean, he, he, if he showed up at your door and knocked, you would let him in. It would be like, you know, somebody, that, you know, a state representative or someone famous, you know, coming to your house. It's like you're not going to say, well, you know, I don't have time for you right now. I mean, He could have ate dinner with anyone. He could have met with anyone. But in John chapter 3, we read that he comes to Jesus. And it's interesting because the Scripture is clear. It says that that he came to him at night. You know, so many times we read the Word of God and we're like, okay, we, you know, so so he came to him at night. What does that mean? Think about what this means. This famous guy, this, this religious elitist that's a Pharisee, that's a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, that's got all the clout and, and everything going for him, you know, what is it going to look like if he goes into Jerusalem of an evening and tries to locate a peasant from Galilee named Jesus? So it's interesting that it says there in John chapter 3 that when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, he comes to him at night under the cover of darkness so no one would see. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus and it seems like he comes with this confession This is what he says, John chapter 3, verse 2. He says, Rabbi. Rabbi is a term of endearment. It means teacher. And so he uses this term to address Jesus, the Son of God. And he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. And listen to how Jesus responds. Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, if you read those two verses side by side together, it's really odd, isn't it? Isn't that kind of an odd answer, a perplexing answer that Jesus gives back to Nicodemus? I mean, okay, let's, let's just run it by again. Nicodemus says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replies, very truly I tell you, No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Unless they're born again. You know what Jesus was really saying here? Nicodemus, you must die and be born again because death is life in me. You must be born again. We use that term a lot as Christians. You've heard that, haven't you? And, and they use it even in surveys now when they survey you know, different groups. Are you a born-again Christian? I mean, what, does that, what does that really mean? If you studied in the Greek, a Greek word there is anothen. And what it means literally is to be born from above. To be born again from above. To be born of spirit. To be born of Jesus. And here's the point of that passage is that you have to become new to come into the kingdom of God. And you have to live your life that way. That before Christ, there's a marked difference in your attitudes and your actions and who you were. Then after you come to Jesus Christ, there's a change. 2 Corinthians 5.17 reminds us of that. As it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. 
I think the struggle for so many of us today is that the old hasn't gone. We hang on to it. Some of us even cherish it. And we have to realize that when we do that, we're losing our life. Not for Him. But we're losing our life in this world, our spiritual walk. But anyone that loses their life for Him will find it. Isn't it interesting that He says you'll find it? Like something's lost and found. If you lose your life in Jesus Christ, you'll actually find it. You know, this idea of being born again, uh, you know, it sounds really good to me because it sounds like you get a do-over. Do you remember as kids, us getting a do-over? Did anybody like ever want a do-over? You know, I mean, we play volleyball on Wednesday nights. Uh, Wednesday night this past week, we had like 25 adults playing volleyball. We had to set up two nets. It was awesome. We'd love for you to join us. 6.30 every Wednesday night, we play together. Um, it's just pick up volleyball, and it's a great time of fellowship, great, great time to get to know people. Love to have you there. But I remember sometimes you go up there and you go to serve in volleyball, and some people are, you know, like really uptight. I mean, you got, we got some people that can serve, you know, they can just flat serve, but we got some people that can't, you know, and they're trying, and it's like, you know, and it's like after they serve, it's like always, oh man, I want, I want a do-over. I wish I could, can I have a do-over? You know, and sometimes we even allow it, you know, when we're really grace-filled, you know, we, we, we allow a do-over. We'll let somebody serve it again. It's like, can I have a do-over? Yeah, we could do, but everybody likes a do-over, right? I mean, you remember that as a child. It's like, oh man, if I could do this over, you know, if, if I can I have a do-over on this paper, sometimes a teacher would have grace on you and, and you flunked a quiz and, or you flunked some homework and they would say, oh, can I, can I have a do-over? And it's like, yes, you can have a do-over. And it, oh, that's great. In essence, that's what it's saying here. If you're born again, it's like you get a do-over in Jesus Christ. You see, death is life when we give up who we are for who we can be in Jesus Christ. And I want to ask you something this morning. If you could be new, like that verse says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Okay? If you could be new, brand new, off the showroom floor, brand new model of yourself, if you could be new, what would you do? If you could be new, what would you do different than the way that you're living your life right now? And some of you, if you're honest, you'd say, man, I wish I had a do-over. Because if I could go back five years, if I could go back to, if I could go back to the situation that changed everything in my life, if I could go back and have a do-over, then I might have hope. Then I might have this newness of life. But we find out here that whoever wants to save their life for the earth for right now will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. And you'll find it in the grace of Jesus Christ because in essence, it's, it's like you do get a do-over. You see, dying is really living in Christ. And so many of you today, you're looking for life's answers. I'm here to tell you as your pastor and just as a spiritual friend that until you get this relationship with Jesus Christ squared away, until you figure that out, until you make that decision to surrender yourself to Him fully, you won't have the life that you want. And that's both now and into eternity. You have to die to the old ways of your life and release sinfulness and really live for Jesus Christ now and for always because He is the answer to all of life's questions. And I know that many of you are, are, are suffering this morning. I got a letter just a couple weeks ago from somebody in the church. Someone just hand wrote a letter, mailed it, and just talking, talking about their life and just how messed up it is. All these regrets, all these consequences of decisions that they had made. And they were asking for prayer, asking for direction. It's like in Jesus Christ, you can be new. I'm not saying that the, all the consequences of your sin and all your choices are going to go away, but 
You're going to have Christ get you through all that. And you can keep your chin up and keep your eyes up because you're going to be focused on Him more than you are yourself. And I know there's some of you this morning that that's exactly where you're at. <laughs> you just need a do-over. You need to die to yourself. You need to be raised to walk in newness of life. And we saw a beautiful illustration of that earlier with Taylor's baptism. Being buried with Christ, being raised to walk in newness of life and the washing of sins away. And it's amazing because it's so simple. What do you have to do? All you have to do is you have to reach out to Him. You call on Him as your Savior and your Lord and your God. And the Bible says He answers. You put your faith in Him and you leave your life of sin. And you go His way. And if you're one of those that you came in here hopeless today, man, today's a good day for you. As you can find hope again in Jesus Christ. If you're in here this morning, you're like, man, I, my life is messed up. My life is messed up. I mean, I've got things that'll make everybody blush. I, I, I made some really poor choices. I don't even want to tell you what I did last night. There's forgiveness. The cross of Jesus Christ through his blood. And I know that most of you want life. You want life that's full. Well, death is life in Jesus Christ. But you got to take that first step. Would you, would you pray with me this morning?